Well, welcome back to everybody. Glad to see you, all of you here and those on Zoom. Our speaker today, all decked out in her sexually selected uh, outfit. <laughs> we animal behaviorists like to dress our part, right? Um, so this is uh, N Nicole Gerlach. She is a colleague from the Department of Biology. Uh, and uh, she is, uh, teaches classes in introductory biology, vertebrate zoology, and animal behavior. She received her PhD from Indiana University, um, which is one of the really premier uh, groups in uh, studying behavior, and uh, an undergraduate degree from Cornell. And uh, she came to the University of Florida Biology Department in 2013. So her, uh, she'll be talking about her research today uh, which is on the mating behavior of songbirds and uh, in particular why some animals engage in extra pair uh, behavior. Um, and today uh, we can put up her uh, thing, yes, uh, her, uh, and today she will be talking about mate choice, monogamy, and cheating. All right. Okay, well, thank you, Jane. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, sound okay? All right. So, uh, as Jane said, I'm Nicole Gerlach, and I am I'm super stoked to be able to talk to you all today. Uh, so I'm going to start out by telling you a little bit about some of the background to my research. So a little bit on sexual selection, mate choice, uh, what sort of the predictions that we make. And then I'm going to move into talking about my specific research organism, which is the dark-eyed junco. Okay, so as every, every biologist starts their talk out, we're going to start out with Darwin. Um, so Darwin is most famous for his 1859 book on the origin of species. But he also wrote a second book in eight, published in 1871 uh, called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And in this book, he addressed some of the exceptions or some of the issues with his theory of evolution by natural selection. And in particular, he was interested in explaining these traits where males and females have very different forms of a trait. So these are what are called sexually dimorphic traits, meaning that the two sexes have two different forms. And in these traits, oftentimes one sex, typically the males, will have really elaborate traits. So think about the train of a peacock. Think about giant antlers on deer. So these traits, where they're really elaborate in one sex, seem like they should run counter to what natural selection would predict. Right? Having that really long, elaborate train on the peacock might make it harder for those males to escape predators. Right? So if natural selection alone was the only force active, we would expect that natural selection would select against those long trains. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, these traits because they're only present in one of the sexes, those traits have to have a benefit that's specific to that sex. If having a long train of tail feathers was beneficial all of the time, then we would expect that both males and females should have it. So Darwin proposed this idea of sexual selection to explain why traits, why these elaborate traits are found only in one sex. And specifically, these traits, these sexually dimorphic traits, need to have some benefit that's going to outweigh their potential cost. And that benefit has to be sex specific. So for example, uh, the male peacock has to benefit from having this long train, but only males benefit from that. It doesn't apply to females. And so what Darwin proposed is that these elaborate traits, these armaments like the antlers or the ornaments like the tail feathers. These elaborate traits served to help the males in terms of mating. So 
they serve to help the males acquire additional mates. And the benefit of that extra mating for the males, he proposed, was enough to outweigh the cost in terms of things like increased predation. So that fits with what we understand. It fits with what we observe, why males should have these elaborate traits. But why is it only the males, right? Why, why don't females get a benefit from having these really elaborate trains and attracting a lot of mates? And so the root of this comes from what's called anisogamy. So to break this word down, an means not, iso means equal, and gamete refers to the gametes, or the eggs in the sperm cells. And so the idea of anisogamy is that males and females have differently sized gametes, that egg cells are really, really large, and sperm cells are quite small. And you can see here the relative size comparison with one very large egg surrounded by hundreds of very small sperm. And the idea here is that for any one individual, if they have a pool of resources that they're going to use to make gametes, that they're going to use to make eggs or use to make sperm, there's going to be a trade-off between how many gametes they make and how big those gametes can be. Right? So this is the same principle if you have like a cake. You can cut that cake into three really large pieces or two. Or hey, you can cut it into one really large piece, just the whole cake for one person. Or you can cut that cake into lots and lots of really tiny pieces. So there's this inverse relationship between how big your gametes are and how many of them you can make. So if you make really large gametes, like the eggs, you can only make a relatively small number of them. But if you make the little gametes, like the sperm, you can make lots of them. And so for males and females, they specialize at two different ends. Females make large eggs full of resources, but they can make relatively few of them, whereas males, since they're making these little tiny sperm, can make hundreds of thousands of them. And so what this means is that males versus females in most species are going to be limited in different ways in terms of how many offspring they can produce. Right? So for females, females, because they're producing these large, energy-intensive, nutrient-rich eggs, they're only going to be able to produce relatively few eggs. So they're going to be limited by how many eggs they can produce. However many eggs they can produce sets that maximum limit on how many offspring they can have. Males, on the other hand, can produce just tons of sperm. Sperm are cheap. And so for a male, males aren't going to be limited by how many sperm they can produce because they can produce, in most species, hundreds of thousands of sperm per day. So the number of offspring that a male can have is going to be limited primarily by how many eggs he can successfully fertilize, or how many mates he can get. So these two different limits in males versus in females is going to lead to different behavioral strategies between the two. So these strategies are summed up uh, in 1948 by a scientist named A.J. Bateman. And one of uh, Bateman's principles is that, as I just said, offspring production should be limited by resources in females, but not by males. So imagine if we have this hypothetical population where every, every female has enough resources to produce 10 eggs. Right? So a female can produce 10 eggs over her lifetime. And the, so that means for a male, the more females he's able to mate with, the more eggs that he's going to fertilize, and so the more offspring he's going to have. 
right? So any trait in a male that allows him to mate with multiple females is going to be favored by sexual selection. That male is going to have, the male who can mate with the most females is going to have the most offspring and therefore is going to leave the most copies of his genes to the next generation. For females though, a female is maxed out in this hypothetical population at 10 offspring, right? She can only produce 10 eggs. And so for females, if she mates with one male, he's going to father all 10 of her offspring. If she mates with two males, the paternity might be different between her offspring, but she can still only make 10 of them, right? She only has the resources to make 10 eggs. If she mates with three males, again, the paternity might be different, but she still is only making 10 offspring. And so what Bateman predicted is that in females, mating with multiple males shouldn't be favored. There's no benefit, he says, to a female mating with more than one male. Because as long as that one male is able to fertilize her eggs, she doesn't gain any additional offspring from mating with additional males. So one of Bateman's predictions is that males should be under selection to mate with multiple females, but females shouldn't be favored, should have no reason to mate with more than one male. So that's great in theory, right? Theoretically sound. But nature, of course, is more complicated than that. So in a number of different species that have been studied, including all of the ones pictured here, females routinely mate with multiple males. And again, in multiple species, they actually violate the predictions that Bateman set out. So in all of these species, females who mate with more than one male actually have more kids. So my, under, or my research is focused around understanding why that's true. Logically, the predictions that Bateman laid out seem like they should be true. But we've got all of this evidence suggesting that in a huge variety of species, females are routinely mating with more than one male. So my research is ultimately designed to answer the question of why. What makes females mate with more than one male? What does she get out of it? And specifically, I look at a behavior that's called extra pair mating. So uh, in a number of species, but it's particularly common in birds, individuals will form what are called monogamous pair bonds, right? Uh, where one female and one male will form an association where they work together to defend a territory, where the male will mate guard that female, they work together to care for offspring. And this association can last during the course of a single breeding season or over multiple breeding seasons. And so, uh, in species that are, that have this social pair bonding behavior, we refer to that male as the within pair male. They are the ones that have formed this pair that lasts throughout the course of the breeding season. And of course, any offspring that they produce are what's called within pair offspring. So WPO, within pair offspring, I'm going to use that abbreviation throughout the talk. And these are referring to offspring whose genetic father is the male associated with their mother. So he is the one that is defending the territory, helping take care of the nest, helping to feed these kids. So he's their social father as well as their genetic father. But in a variety of species uh, that have this socially monogamous setup, we also have, uh, or females also engage in what are called extra pair copulations. 
or EPCs. And so this is when a female is uh, mating, or copulating with a male who is not her pair bonded partner. Right? So typically this is a male from a neighboring territory uh, and females will mate in some cases with these males who are not their pair bonded partner. And so we refer to him as the extra pair male. And any offspring that result are going to be called extra pair offspring or EPO. And so potentially within one nest, we could have some offsprings who are related to the male taking care of them, to the social male, and other offspring, the extra pair offspring, who are unrelated to the male that is taking care of them. So the species that I work on uh, is known as the dark-eyed junco, junco hymalis. Uh, is anybody familiar with them? And can, not really, a couple people. Okay. So in most of the country, juncos are really common songbirds. Uh, most people see them at their winter feeder, but if you look at the distribution line, it stops like right at the Florida Georgia border. Uh, so juncos are found across the rest of North America. Um, they are sparrows, so uh, they are socially monogamous during the breeding season, which in most places runs from April to August, give or take. Uh, they do form these social pairs where one male and one female will get together, defend a territory, build a nest, lay offspring, and defend and care for those offspring. Uh, if they're successful, they can do this multiple times over the course of the breeding season. Uh, so they can have multiple nests up to say 12 or 16 kids per summer. Uh, they are somewhat, uh, they do provide parental care. So both the males and the females will feed the offspring, care for the offspring, defend them from predators. Um, they typically have four eggs at a time. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's five but typically four, nests, or four eggs at a time. And the really great thing about this species is that they nest on the ground. So we are able to find and monitor their nests without having to climb trees, uh, which makes them very easy to study. It also makes them unfortunately very prone to predation. Uh, so snakes, chipmunks, predatory birds, all sorts of things will take out these nests. So uh, this research is done on a population of juncos that live at, uh, at and around the Mountain Lake Biological Station in southwestern Virginia. So right about there. Um, if anyone has seen the movie Dirty Dancing, this is like two miles up the road from where that was filmed. Uh, so you can see that the juncos, their breeding range Mostly they breed in northern latitudes, uh, but they also breed at high, high elevations. So down the Appalachian Mountains, down the Rocky Mountains, they like it where it's cold. Uh, and then these populations during the winter will come down into the rest of the country uh, where many people will see them at their winter feeders. Uh, they often are referred to as snowbirds uh, which again has a very different meaning if you're in Florida. Um, but, uh, so this study is based on this long-term, uh, this population that's been monitored at Mountain Lake B Biological Station uh, since 1983. So we are at 40 years now of monitoring this population. Um, my specific study is based on birds from 1990 through 2007. 2007. Uh, and in that time, we've got over 2,000 nestlings that are included in my, uh, in my study.
So a little bit about how we go about studying these birds. So the first thing that we do is we need to trap the birds and give them unique bands, band combinations. So early in the season, typically before breeding actually starts, we'll catch birds in uh, walk-in traps. Juncos also forage primarily on the ground, so I'm making them very easy to catch. Or in these mist nets there, which are made of these fine threads that are invisible or near invisible to flying birds, so that we can capture them safely, take measurements on their body size and their feathers. Uh, and we take, at that time, uh, we give them their individual uh, band combinations. So they get a series of colored bands as well as a numbered band so that we can tell them apart later. And we draw a small blood sample. So this is uh, a few drops of blood taken from the same vein that you would get blood drawn from in the bird's elbow. Uh, and then, so we have that blood so that we can do things like analyze their DNA. Then for the rest of the season, once we've got the adults all banded, we spend the rest of the season looking to find nests. And so we will do things like looking to find individuals carrying nesting material and follow them to see if we can find where their nests are. Once we find the nests, we will then monitor those nests as the female is laying eggs, as those eggs hatch, up to the point where they leave the nest. So the female incubates the nest for about uh, two weeks, give or take. These are freshly hatched day zero baby juncos. Uh, I think they're adorable. They sort of look like weird little aliens, but yeah. And each one of those weighs about as much as a penny. So very small. Um, we continue to monitor them as they grow. Once they reach six days old, which is this little guy there, we take a tiny blood sample from the babies as well. So again, about two or three drops out of that same vein so that we can get DNA on the babies as well to determine who their genetic father is so that we can do those paternity tests. We continue to monitor the babies until they're ready to leave the nest, which is at about 11 days old. Again, because they're nesting on the ground, they get out of that nest really quickly uh, since predation is such a big threat. So this baby bird obviously can't fly yet. Like, it's got that stubby little tail there. Uh, but they will leave the nest at about that stage, and it's about another week or so before they're able to start flying. And then using the blood samples that we drew from uh, the babies and from the adults, I run paternity testing, which is looking at variation in the DNA to see whether the DNA of each offspring matches the DNA of the father who is taking care of them. So whether that offspring is a within pair offspring or an extra pair offspring. So first, let's look at sort of generally what, what I found uh, in terms of extra pair behavior in this population. So here and th for throughout the talk, extra pair offspring are gonna be in orange, within pair offspring are gonna be in purple. So in the population as a whole, so out of all of those 2,000 nestlings that we collected blood samples from, about a little over a quarter of them were extra pair offspring. That means in this population, 27% of babies are fathered by a neighbor. They are fathered by someone other than the male who is bringing them food and taking care of them. All right? Uh, so it, this is all very scandalous. It's all very daytime talk show. And so that actually puts them towards the higher end of other bird species. So this graph is showing what percentage of offspring are extra pair in various bird species. And so juncos are not the most scandalous, uh, but they're towards the upper end. 
So some species have more, or, <clears throat> excuse me, a higher rate of extra pair offspring. Many species have a lower rate, but 27% is near the upper bound. If we look at where these extra pair offspring are coming from, so we're looking within broods or within nests, most nests only have a single father. So in purple are the nests that are entire, all of the offspring are fathered by their social father. The orange ones are ones where all of the offspring in a nest are entirely fathered by a neighbor. And then the green ones are ones where we have mixed paternity. So some of the offspring are related to the social father, other ones are related to an extra pair father. And so that accounts for about only about 20% of nests have mixed paternity. And if we look at it from a female point of view, in females, about over 50% of females only ever produce within pair offspring. So that purple bar is 55% of females remain entirely faithful to their extra pair off or to their excuse me to their within pair partner. They don't ever produce any offspring with an extra pair male. There are about 12 or 13% of females who only ever produced extra pair offspring. So they never produced an offspring with their social partner. And then the remaining roughly 30% of, of females produced some mix over their lifetime. So they produced some within pair offspring and some extra pair offspring. So we've got a lot of variation here in female behavior. And remember, what we're looking for here is why. Why are some females ma mating multiply, mating with multiple males, even though Bateman's predictions say that females shouldn't benefit from mating with more than one male? So there's sort of three questions or three ways that I approach this. So the first is, does this behavior actually affect their fitness? Does it affect how many offspring they can produce, right? So do these females who mate with males who are not their social partner get some kind of benefit over the females who remain faithful to their, uh, to their social partner? The next question is maybe it has something to do with the offspring. So maybe a female who is producing extra pair offspring Maybe those offspring are better quality somehow. And then finally, I wanted to look at what traits predict which females are going to engage in this behavior and which females aren't. Right. So we're going to start with this first question of whether or not extra pair mating affects female fitness, if it affects how many offspring they can produce. So just to remind you, our prediction here is that for males, mating with more than one male, or excuse me, for males, mating with more than one female should mean that a male gets more offspring. Whereas the prediction is for females, mating with multiple males shouldn't affect how many offspring a female is able to produce. So let's start with the males. So this is this graph may look a little bit different than what some of the ones you've seen. It's essentially a scatter plot, except the size of the bubble indicates how many individuals are at that point. So we've got a lot of males who never got a mate and never produced offspring, and then only like one male who was able to produce 26 offspring over the course of his life. So what we can see from this is that for males, Bateman's prediction is supported, right? Males who were able to father offspring with multiple females had more offspring, more genetic offspring, over the course of their life. Right? So, so far, we're matching Bateman's predictions. But when we look at this for females, 
the slope for females is shallower than it is for the males, but it's still positive. For females, even females who are able to mate with multiple males do have at least a slightly higher number of total offspring. So this suggests that I should add juncos to that slide in the beginning with all of those uh, all of those species where the females mate with multiple males. And they're getting at least some benefit from doing so. But if we look at who those males are, so on this previous slide, we're just looking at the total number of males. We're not saying whether they are within pair or extra pair males. But if we break it down by the number of within pair partners versus the number of extra pair partners, the story changes a little bit. So here's looking at how many extra pair partners an individual had versus how many offspring they were able to produce. And this is looking at how many within pair partners an individual had versus how many offspring they were able to produce. And hopefully what you can see is that this slope is a lot higher for both males and females for within pair partners. So these individuals or the species form these pairs early in the breeding season, but like the offspring, like the nests, the adults are also susceptible to predation. Right? Uh, birds of prey, mammals, anything that can catch them will eat them. Um, and so it seems like it may be the case that being able to replace your social partner mid-breeding season is going to have the most effect on how successful you are, right? Because they can have repeated nests, repeated broods over the social season, but if your partner gets eaten midway through, being able to replace them with a new partner is going to mean that you're going to be much more successful. And it's less about whether or not you're able to find extra pair partners. So for this first question, yes, females have a positive Bateman gradient. Mating with more than one male does increase the number of offspring that a female is able to have. But that's probably due more to this within pair mating than it is to extra pair mating. So it seems like females are probably under the strongest selection to be able to replace a mate mid-season. Uh, and that's going to be more important for females than being able to mate with extra pair partners. So our second question, my second question is looking at whether being an extra pair offspring affects anything from the offspring's point of view. So we looked at whether or not engaging in extra pair mating affects the female's outcome. Now I'm going to turn our attention to what happens from the kid's point of view. Does it matter if your genetic father is the dad that's taking care of you, or the dad that's, or the male that's a neighbor. Okay. So this is one of our little six-day-old birds uh, watching information about itself get recorded. Okay. So in these systems, where at the beginning of the breeding season, males and females form these pairs. It's sort of like a game of musical chairs, right? Not everybody can be in a social pair with the best male, right? Once that individual is off the market, once they've been paired up, then other individuals have to choose from who's left. So it stands to reason that some individuals might wind up with a social partner that is not the one that they would optimally prefer. And so these individuals might get a benefit if they're paired to one social partner 
who maybe is not the one that they would most prefer, they might get a benefit from mating with a more preferred extra pair partner. Right? So they might want to mate with an extra pair male who is more attractive or more healthy, or potentially someone who is less related to them or who has genes that would work better with their own. And so the idea here is that maybe the reason that females are engaging in these extra pair copulations is not about increasing the number of offspring that the females can have, but maybe it's about increasing the quality that those off of the offspring that a female can have. So she might still be limited at 10 offspring, uh, to go back to our hypothetical population, but if you can make those 10 offspring as good as they can possibly be, you might still get a benefit. And so we would expect that if this is true, those extra pair offspring should be better in some way than the within pair offspring. Right? So if females are mating with extra pair males in order to take advantage of those males' excellent genetic qualities, those qualities should pass down to their kids. So we looked at this across a wide span of offspring life. So again, starting early on at laying, moving through the hatchling stage, while they're nestlings, up to the point where they leave the nest or fledge at about 11 days old. We continued following them through the juvenile phase which are these little streaky brown sub-adult ones. They don't molt into their nice gray and white plumage until later. And ultimately until they return to our population as adults. So we're gonna sort of walk through this timeline of offspring life to see if there's any point where being an extra pair offspring gives you an advantage. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're still talking all about the juncos. So first off, we wanted to check if there was any difference in sex. Uh, so whether male or female offspring were more likely to be extra pair.